of justice will be brought before man. Now you shall have to explain your whole life span. What you did in the open and what you conceive. From big to small shall today. بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته My dear brothers and sisters Welcome to another episode in our series on the journey to the afterlife We spoke previously about the topic of the journey of the soul after death As well as the day of resurrection As well as the descriptions of the hellfire And we described paradise From what we know is a description of paradise and as we are nearing the end of the topic of paradise, we want to focus on an issue that will help you and I reach paradise by the mercy of Allah. And this is the issue of your relationship and my relationship with the book of Allah. The relationship with the Quran. The words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So today's topic will all cover the, the issue of having a relationship with the Quran and do, doing what we can to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this surrounds three issues. Number one, sincerity. Number two, understanding the importance and significance of the Qur'an and our relationship with the Qur'an, the benefits therein. And number three, action. To act upon our relationship with the Qur'an, meaning our understanding and the teachings of the Qur'an. So as for the issue of sincerity, my dear brothers and sisters, there are so many people that come and complain and they say, I want to be a better Muslim, but... I want to become a better believer, however. And they will always have some excuse. If you want to become a better person, you have to remove excuses from your life. Because there are people, wallahi, from all walks of life, every type of scenario you can imagine, and they've become better. Because it all goes back to the issue of sincerity. It all goes back to the heart. How much do you really want to become better? Are you saying you want to become better? Or will you do something that will help you become better? Will you actually put in some effort? So there needs to be sincerity because sincerity is what drives the believer. And so the actions all go back to the intentions. Now, this issue of sincerity, a lot of Muslims will say, I want more knowledge, I want to become better, I want this, I want that. What are you doing about it? Now, one example of this is a story that was circulating a few years ago about a four-year-old girl. She's four years of age. So this girl, she's in a non-Islamic country, a non-Islamic school. And they're taking care of the children, the teachers. So they have a break for the students. So they tell the kids to go and play and then to go and eat. So the kids, they all go to eat lunch except for one girl. She's a Muslim girl. She doesn't know much, but she's a little girl and she's Muslim. She knows that. So the teacher says, are you not going to eat? She says, no, I cannot eat today. She says, what do you mean you can't eat today? She says, I'm fasting. She says, you're fasting? She says, yes, it's Ramadan. The teacher says, who's Ramadan? What is Ramadan? What does that mean? She says, we cannot eat. We're not allowed to eat. The teacher is shocked. So she says, it's okay, I'll give you some food. She says, no, I'm, I'm fasting. I, I want to fast. She says, how about this? I'll give you some food. You'll eat it here in this classroom. And nobody will ever find out. Your parents won't know. So she's assuming that she's fasting, the four-year-old, because of her mom and dad. The girl says, I'm not fasting for my parents. I don't care. Allah is watching me. Allah is taking care of me. The teacher has goosebumps. She's so shocked at this response from a little kid, four or five years old. She says, God is watching me. I don't care if my parents know. So she refuses to eat. The teacher is so amazed that she calls the parents of this child. She asks them, what is Ramadan? What is fasting? She wants to make sure that the child is not being starved. She says, what is happening? They explain to her about Ramadan, about Islam, about fasting. And eventually the teacher learns so much about Islam, she decides to become Muslim. So she says the shahada and she becomes Muslim. This story is so amazing because it all goes back to the four-year-old girl. She, was, she had this innocence, this sincerity that Allah is watching me at all times so I'm not doing this for people 
I'm not being Muslim for my parents. I'm not being Muslim because of society or where I live. I'm submitting to Allah because Allah is watching me. That is the essence of it. So, subhanAllah, when you have this sincerity, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take care of you in ways beyond which you can imagine. This is a four-year-old girl. And one time I was traveling. I was 14 years old. I was traveling from a Quran school, an institute, back to where my parents lived. And on the airplane, I opened up the Mus'haf and I was reading Quran. And the person sitting next to me was an older woman that wasn't Muslim. And it didn't occur to me at that time that people were so afraid of Muslims, especially when it came to flying. So I was reading from the Quran, I was reviewing, and she looked at it and I noticed she became afraid or something was happening to her. So she was looking back and forth very quickly as if to see, is anybody else seeing this? This kid is reading Quran on an airplane. And I was reading and reading and eventually she spoke to me, she says, what are you reading? I said, I'm reading Quran. It's the Islamic scripture that we believe in. It's from God to mankind, the divine way of life. She says, what is that page that you're reading? What does it say? She was afraid. She had some misunderstanding about the Quran. I said, I'm reading here Surah Maryam. This is the story of Mary. Now, my point about this is that sometimes you might do something, even if you're young or even if you're old, you might do something and not realize that there's something behind it. And this is just an example. So you might be reading Qur'an in front of someone, you might be fasting, you might be praying, you might be doing anything at all. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless you and guide others through you without you even noticing. And many times you won't know. Many times you won't realize it. So if you want to have a relationship with the Qur'an, you need to first perfect your relationship with Allah, meaning you need to be sincere. So ask yourself, you want to have a relationship with the Qur'an, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Are you sincere about this? Do you really want this? What are you going to do? What do you want it to do for you? Do you understand the significance of the Qur'an? So this brings us to the second segment, understanding the importance of the Qur'an. The Qur'an, my dear brothers and sisters, is the last miracle of the Prophet ﷺ, the final mu'jiza. Because some people, they'll say, if I was alive at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, I would have just wanted to see all of these miracles so that I could be a strong believer. But you do realize that many people were alive at that time, the people of Quraysh, and they rejected the Prophet ﷺ. They didn't benefit from seeing these miracles because of something in their hearts. It goes back to your heart, understanding the importance of the divinity of the Qur'an, the speech of Allah that He's giving to all of mankind in order to be saved. This is the path to salvation. So the last miracle of the Prophet ﷺ is with you. Are you taking advantage of this miracle? Are you studying this beautiful miracle? The noble Qur'an, the noble speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Qur'an, my dear brothers and sisters, is the only guide to your life. Meaning it is the sole way of salvation. If you don't have the Qur'an, you don't have a way, a path to be saved. You don't have a manual for your life. You don't have a divine, perfect manual to get to paradise. And so the Qur'an is a guidance for every single person in this world. It is a guidance, meaning it is a path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Along with its description, and its exemplification through Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Quran, my dear brothers and sisters, you have to understand, it's not just a guidance, it's not just the last miracle from the creator to the creation. It's also a cure for every type of illness. It's a cure for every physical and emotional and mental and spiritual illness. The Quran, my dear brothers and sisters, the one who is depressed and they start to understand and study the Quran, and they start to study Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's speech, they start to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they realize that they have this tranquility through the Quran. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَلَا بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ Verily in the remembrance of Allah, do the hearts find tranquility, do the hearts find rest. And you feel at peace, at ease when you recite the Quran. Oftentimes, someone will be making dua. And while they're making dua, while they're praying to Allah, they don't realize after they start reciting, until they start reciting, that what they're reading applies to them. So you might be reading Qur'an one day, and you're going through something, and you notice that Allah is speaking to you. Allah is speaking directly to you. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the Qur'an in order for us to be saved and happy in this life, even before the next. Furthermore, my dear brothers and sisters, one of the best things you and I can do in this world is to memorize and to teach the Qur'an to others. So the Prophet ﷺ told us, if the Qur'an is gathered inside a vessel, inside a heart, that person will never be punished with the hellfire. Allah will never allow that person to be punished with the hellfire. 
And it's an authentic hadith. The Quran, my dear brothers and sisters, the Prophet ﷺ said, it is an intercessor. It makes shafa'ah for people. Something that is given permission to intercede by Allah. And it is rightfully believed in. He said, whoever puts the Quran in front of him, it will lead him to paradise. And whoever throws it behind him or abandons it, it will lead them to the hellfire. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from the hellfire. The Quran, my dear brothers and sisters, the one who becomes a friend of the Quran, Ahlul Quran, these are the people who are the friends of Allah, the companions of Allah. Hum Ahlullahi wa khasatu. Ahlul Quran, who are they? They are the friends of Allah and a description of his characteristics, meaning they embody the Quran, the exemplification of the words of Allah. Can you imagine? You have the opportunity to be part of an elite group, a chosen group, the group of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some people race to be part of elite groups or clubs. You have an opportunity to be a part of the club of Allah, the group of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another benefit is that when you become a person of the Qur'an and you memorize it and you teach it to others, you are considered and guaranteed as one of the best types of people in this world. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, خَيْرُكُمْ مَنْ تَعَلَّمَ الْقُرْآنَ وَعَلَّمَ The best amongst you, the best, the top amongst you are those who memorize the Qur'an and they teach it to others. And they teach it to other people. So you're spreading the khayr. You're benefiting from it and you're teaching it to others. Another of the benefits is that memorizing the Qur'an, as we said before, will help you raise your levels in paradise. So Allah will tell you, recite and elevate. And wherever you recite the last ayah that you remember, that's where you will stay eternally. The Qur'an will help you reach that state. Furthermore, the Qur'an is a protection from every evil and harm. You want a shield against harm in your life, against the harm of shaitan, against any kind of evil from the devils, then memorize and recite the Qur'an often. The Qur'an will protect you from spiritual deviancy when you internalize it and you are enlightened through it. The Qur'an will heal you of every physical and spiritual illness. Even physical illnesses, you recite the Qur'an on these illnesses, it is a cure. The Qur'an is a form of happiness and peace. The Qur'an brings about the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, nobody amongst you, no people gather in one of the houses of Allah to study the book of Allah. They're reciting it and they're studying it amongst themselves, except that sakina, tranquility, will descend upon them. They will have tranquility from Allah. And mercy will envelop them. The rahmah of Allah will envelop you. And the angels will surround you. The malaika will surround you. And Allah will mention you amongst those who are with Him. Ya yeah, Allah. You study the book of Allah and you recite the book of Allah. Try to understand it. The tafsir of the Qur'an will bring you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Furthermore, one of the Sahaba used to recite Surah Al-Ikhlas every time at the end of the prayer. So the last Surah he would recite Surah Al-Ikhlas. قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدُ So one time the Sahaba said, what is this? They went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and they said, this Sahabi, this man is always reciting قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدُ He said, ask him why. So they went back and asked him, why do you always do this? He said, I do this because Surah Al-Ikhlas describes the attributes of Allah. Describes that Allah is the one. It beautifies and summarizes simply what we believe in about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Say He is Allah the one, Allah the self-sustaining, the absolute. He begets not, nor is He begun. Meaning He is not born, nor does He have children. Allah is one. And there is nothing like Him. There is no one equal to Him. Summary of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Tell this man that Allah loves him. So through your love of the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will love you as well. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of Ahlul Qur'an, the people of the Qur'an, so that we are protected and happy in this life and in the next life. We're going to take a short break and we'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. really come to understand that to be a Muslim, to be someone who says they've surrendered and submitted to the will of God, is to be in harmony with everything around you and to be a benefit to it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our creator, he gave us a life plan. He told us what to do. He, he gave us, you know, goals and what he expects from us. It has roots in Islam because the first man who was created, Adam, he was neither a Jew or a Christian, but he submitted himself to God, Abraham. He didn't submit to anyone in creation. He didn't even hear in any of these religions. But when he was told to do what? Submit to the will of God, that's it's not attached to his preconceived notions. Yes. And if he looks with an objective eye and an open heart, he'll see it. 
unless Allah for some reason has something over his eyes because of something that we don't know is in his heart. Uh, you had from 1980 to 2005, you had the FBI data report showing that now from all these years that only 6% had any links to uh, Islam. 94% were people who had nothing to do with Islam. This is the thing, Joe. This is the thing, this is the thing, Joe. One day the Prophet ﷺ came out to the companions عنهم, and he said to them, Don't you bear witness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one worthy of worship and he has no partners? Don't you bear witness that I'm the messenger of Allah? Don't you bear witness that the Quran is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So the companions عنهم, they said, Yes, O Prophet of Allah. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, فأبشروا. Have the glad tidings, the great news as a result of this. Because the Quran has two ends to it. One end with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and one end in your hands. Then he said to them alayhi salatu wasalam, فَتَمَسَّكُوا بِهِ Hold fast to it because you would never be led astray and you would never be perished if you're holding fast to the book of Allah. Because of that, join us every week in Quran in depth where we recite and reflect and ponder over the verses of the Quran. We go in depth into the verses following the ways of the Prophet ﷺ and the companions عنهم, when they used to take the verses, one set of verses after another. They would recite it, they would reflect upon the meanings of it and they would act according to it and then they would go to the next set of verses. Join us every week in Quran in depth so that we would recite and reflect and learn more about the book of Allah we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless our life and to make us among those who follow the Quran and the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Welcome back from the break. Before we took a short break, we were discussing the issue of having a relationship with the Quran and the benefits of memorizing and internalizing and acting upon the Quran. This is something that will change our lives. This is something that will grant you happiness and protection in this life, even before the next, because these are the words of the Creator, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now we mentioned that the one who abandons the Quran, this person will be led to the hellfire through that because the Quran will testify against you either for you or against you. So ask yourself, where are you with your relationship with the Qur'an? Just studying the basics of it or reading it a little at a time, as much as possible, and trying to do more and more and more. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimullah, he mentions that abandoning the Qur'an is the following. Number one, he says, abandoning it by not listening to its recitation or giving attention to it. By not acting upon it, or abiding by what was prescribed in the Qur'an of halal and haram, even if the person believes in it or they recite it. So you have to act upon it. Number three, abandoning it by not taking it as a ruling or as a judge in all matters of religion. Number four, by not reflecting upon the meanings of the Qur'an and understanding them and knowing what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants or desires from you and the one who recites from it. And number five, by not using it as a cure or not using it as a healing for all the diseases and the ailments of the heart, such as one that seeks the cure for their illness from somewhere else, whereas the Qur'an is the cure for your heart. The Qur'an is the only thing that will really ultimately make you happy and ultimately give you peace because it is a dhikr, it is the remembrance of Allah that will give you happiness and tranquility in your heart. So when you give the Qur'an a priority in your life, when you place the Qur'an as a priority in your life by studying it, by reciting it, even if a little at a time, by listening to lectures about the Qur'an. The Qur'an will give you light, nur, it will give you mercy, rahmah, it will give you a cure, shifa, and happiness in this life and the next life. 
And at the time of death, oftentimes a person will start to express what is really in their hearts. A person who is dying, you're telling them, say, la ilaha illallah. At this moment, the thing that really encompasses their heart will come out at the time of death, at the moment of death. And so you will be resurrected upon what you died upon. And you can only die upon what you lived upon truly in your heart. So some people we mentioned, at the moment of death, they'll start to sing musical lyrics. Some people at the moment of death, they'll, talk, they'll start talking about money and finances. Some people at the moment of death, they'll be filled with grudges and hatred for others. Some people at the moment of death, they will recite the Qur'an. And they will say the Shahada. So imagine, my dear brothers and sisters, that you're from amongst those people that we hear of in many stories all around us. We mentioned that around the world, 150,000 people die every single day. Some of these people were able to say the Shahada. Some of them were able to say Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, to recite Al-Fatiha. Some of them died reciting the Qur'an because they lived upon it. They were people of the Qur'an. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make you and I from amongst the people of the Qur'an. So let's talk about the third segment. We talked about sincerity. You have to really want it. It starts with you and your heart. We talked about the significance and the importance of it, what it does for you, the reason why we want it. Now let's start, let's start talking about the action, actually implementing it. So some of the excuses people have for not reading the Qur'an, some people will say, number one, I don't have time. But this is a lie. Everyone has time. I'm sure you have 10 minutes if you needed 10 minutes to recite Qur'an. Do you know how we know this? Because if somebody told you if you recited it, the Qur'an for 10 minutes, and they will give you a palace, a mansion as a gift, you will find 10 minutes in your daytime. You will find time to recite the Qur'an. So you really do have time. This is an excuse. Find time, make time. Because the Qur'an, if it's a priority in your life, you will find time for it. It goes back to sincerity. Number two, some people say, I recite enough Qur'an in Salah. I recite enough in the Salah. Now Alhamdulillah, you're reciting the Qur'an in your prayers. Because this is a must. But unless you are somebody who memorized the entire Qur'an, and you still remember it, a large majority of what people recite in the Salah is usually very short. The people usually recite, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٌ they usually recite, إِنَّا عَطَيْنَا كَالْكَوْثَرِ وَالْعَصْرِ إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ They'll recite something short. They're trying to get through their salah. But once you memorize a lot of Qur'an, you will naturally and essentially become of the people who recite more and more and more, inside of salah and outside of it. Number three, as an excuse, is some people will say, I have mental blocks. Every time I sit down to memorize, I just don't feel like it. This is an excuse, this is a cop-out. If you want to memorize or read, just read Qur'an, Force yourself to sit down and focus. And remove distractions from your life. Remove your smartphone if that's distracting you. Stop listening to music because music will affect your recitation of the Qur'an. Remove any obstacle. Number four as an excuse is guilt. Somebody will say, I'm guilty. I commit so much haram. Why, why should I come read Qur'an? Why should I do that? Somebody will say, I'm a bad person. I'm not deserving of it. I don't want to be hypocritical because I'm going to read and I'm going to go commit a sin. So the trick of shaitan, the whisper of shaitan, he tells you, don't read Qur'an because you commit sins. So instead of moving forward and progressing, you're moving backwards. What you should do is if you think to yourself that you're guilty or you commit sins, tell yourself, I will read Qur'an and I will try to repent for my sin and do so. So you're moving forward now closer to Allah. And shaitan will become upset with this. Number five, some people will say, I don't have the ability to read. Find yourself a teacher, find a way to learn because we have so many resources in our times. Find someone to help you even if it's a little and at the very least listen to as much Qur'an as possible and lectures about the Qur'an. Lectures explaining what the Qur'an is about. So this is an excuse. And number six and the last excuse we'll mention. Some people will say, I don't understand the Qur'an. Why should I recite it? Lack of understanding. Similar to the last excuse, find a teacher, find a lecture. There's so many lectures online. We have the blessing in our times of the internet. Use the internet for good. Use it for khair. So listen to lectures explaining what the Qur'an is about and you won't have this excuse. Now, what are some practical tips to start reading the Qur'an? Number one, first and foremost, set yourself a daily amount of time. If you don't read Qur'an at all, start with something simple. 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes and increase. And inshallah, once you become a person of the Qur'an, you'll be reciting for hours every day. And you'll enjoy it. It won't feel like a burden. So start with something small and simple, but be consistent. Be consistent. Tell yourself today, starting today, I want to start with this amount of Qur'an. Don't wait for Ramadan. Don't wait for marriage. Don't wait to become better later. Start now and start today. Number two, make it a habit. 
So do it every single day. You know the same way some people, they do things every single day. The same way you eat every day and you sleep every night. Recite the Qur'an every single day, even if it's 10 or 20 minutes. Make it a habit in your life. Number three, sign up for some kind of class or halaqa or something where you can recite Qur'an with other people. You can study it with other people. This way it will encourage you. And number four, surround yourself with the Qur'an. Have the Qur'an playing all the time in your house, in your car, on your phone. You don't need music in your life, but you do need Qur'an in your life. You don't need music to get to Jannah, but you need the Qur'an to get to Jannah. Music will not help lead you to Allah, but the Qur'an will lead you to Allah. The Qur'an will give you that light and happiness. So my dear brothers and sisters, surround yourself with the Qur'an. Surround yourself with the recitation of it, with its understanding. Some people make excuses for themselves, while others, they go forward. They get over their excuses, they get over their obstacles. Now, somebody will ask, a man asks, why doesn't Allah speak to us? I just want to know, if Allah would speak to us, what would He say to us? My dear brothers, Allah does speak to you. You have the Qur'an. Do you study the Qur'an? Do you understand it? Not from your own opinions, but from what the Prophet ﷺ explained of the Qur'an and the Sahaba and the Mufassirin. What is your relationship with the words of Allah? A man will say, no, I don't study the Qur'an. But Allah is speaking to you. Don't you see that Allah is speaking to you? His words are here for you. Study the words of Allah, ponder upon them, reflect upon them. You want to know what Allah will say to mankind? Read the Qur'an. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, ya ayyuhal nasu, O mankind, O people who believed, O you who believe, Allah is speaking to us. So don't give yourself an excuse, a reason not to study or recite the Qur'an, rather give yourself a reason to study the Qur'an. And don't wait, my brothers and sisters. There's an example of a brother in recent years, he had a brain tumor, and he had a few months to live. What happened to him was he started to lose his memory. And he started telling his friend every time he came over, he said, recite Qur'an to me. And then one day he died. His friend said, I'm crying, not because he died, I'm crying because he had to lose everything in his life, all of his blessings. He dropped out of school. He lost his job. He lost his marriage because he lost his memory and his health. And he died. But right before he died, he lost everything of the dunya. So he started to focus on the Qur'an. He read Qur'an every day before he died. And he used to forget. 10, 20 minutes later, he would forget what he recited. He forgot Surah Al-Fatiha. So he said, I'm crying. Because we say, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. But we don't act like we mean it. We don't act like we care about it. Because if we did, then we would recite the Qur'an. We would study the Qur'an every single day. We don't wait for the moment to die. The moment to lose our blessings. You have your blessings, use them now. A brother came up to me after Tarawih prayer one day. He said, I could hear your recitation. And I didn't understand what he meant. And he started typing on his phone. He couldn't talk to me that well. He said, my name is such and such. When I was 16 years old, I completed the memorization of the Qur'an. And in that same year, I had a disease in my ears. I lost the ability to hear. And I noticed that he had his hearing aids. He said, I cannot hear at all. But I memorized the entire Qur'an and I'm grateful to Allah. I'm grateful to Allah. They allowed me to memorize the Qur'an before I lost the ability to hear. Ya Allah. So use your blessings before they're taken away. He said that night I was able to hear the Qur'an in the Salah. And he doesn't usually hear anything. Allah allowed him to hear it. So my dear brothers and sisters, use your blessings to have a relationship with the Qur'an before it's taken away. And know that the Qur'an is a path to paradise. The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever recites Ayat al-Kursi at the end of each obligatory prayer, meaning afterwards, Nothing will stop you from entering Jannah except death. Ayatul Kursi is a path to paradise. The Prophet ﷺ said, Whoever reads the last two verses of Surah Al-Baqarah at night, the last two ayahs of Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah number two, every night, they will suffice you. They will protect you the entire night. The Prophet ﷺ told us, reciting Surah Al-Ikhlas is like reciting one-third of the Qur'an. So much hasanat in Qul Hu Allahu Ahad. One-third of the Qur'an. The Prophet ﷺ told us, that reciting Surah Al-Mulk will protect you in the grave. It will protect you on the Day of Judgment. Surah Al-Mulk, reciting it every night. The Prophet ﷺ told us, whoever recites Surah Al-Kaf on the Day of Jumu'ah, a light will shine for you between this Friday and the next. In another hadith, he said, a light will extend for you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's throne, from the Kaaba of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to you. And you will be safe on the Day of Resurrection. The Prophet ﷺ told us, whoever prays with 100 verses at night, recites 100 ayahs at night, it will be written for you as if you pray the entire night. The Prophet ﷺ said, 
Whoever reads قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ Ten times. Ten times قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ Allah will build for you a palace in Jannah. My dear brothers and sisters, the Qur'an is a shield. There are so many things to do with the Qur'an. So many lessons from the Qur'an. So many gems from the Qur'an. So much light in the Qur'an. It is required of us to accept this light. To recite the Qur'an as much as possible. To understand what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us for our shortcomings when it comes to the Qur'an. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of Ahlul Qur'an, whom Ahlullah wa khasatu, the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us and guide us and accept from us. We will see you next time, inshallah ta'ala, as we discuss the final thing, the final stages of the people of paradise and the best reward of the people of Jannah, the meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jazakumullah khaira, wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Justice will be brought before man Now you shall have to explain your whole life span What you did in the open and what you conceived From big to small shall to thee Your deeds shall then be weighed in a scale. This shall determine if you pass or fail. Heaven and hell shall be brought into vision. Allah alone.